This edition of Computer Club Lesson was recorded on April the 25th, 2016. Enjoy! Hello, welcome to Computer Club Lesson. This episode is brought to you by the Binary Guys. Alright, so here we are folks, it's one o'clock and it's time to get started with this. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take care of uh, one of your classmates' problems about pictures and email, getting them into email, and then getting them out again. Okay. Now, before I started the class, I set up a picture of the class that I can attach to an email and send it to myself, which is the way to test this. So. I am going to do a compose an email, and I'm in Gmail, by the way, and um, so I've uh, clicked on compose, and it brings up the, uh, the uh, compose message box in Gmail. Uh, it's the same for all of the online services, uh, Gmail, Hotmail, Outlook, well, I, uh, Hotmail is Outlook, Yahoo Mail, all of them. If you go to a web page, uh, you essentially click on compose and then you put in an address, a subject line, and you send your email. So in this case, I'm going to get, I'm going to give me as the two people, and that's coming from me, the two people. And uh, this is the subject. You always want to put a subject line in an email because if it doesn't have it, the receiver on the other end. Uh, may decide that it's spam and do one of two things with it. Um, send it to the spam folder, which you don't very often check, or send it straight to the trash, which you never check. Okay, so an important email can get lost just simply because you have not put a subject in the subject line. So uh, I've done that, uh, just the word pick. I'm going to do it again in the body of the text. I'm just putting the word pick so that I know what it is, anybody else would know what it is. But you need some text. Okay, just plain text. Now I'm going to attach the email, or attach the picture to the body of this email. Or, uh, not to the body, but to the email. In some instances, it attaches it to the body. It puts the picture right in the email. And that's called inline. A picture in line is usually in the body of the text, but in this case, it's just an attachment. Down here at the bottom, and on your email package, it may be different somewhere else, but there's a little paper clip. What do you do with a paper clip? You attach paper to it, okay? You attach something, so the word attach is what you're looking for, and that's where you make the attachment. So we will click on that. And it opens up a file explorer saying, well, where do you want to attach to things? Where, where's the stuff you want to attach to? Is it in your pictures? Uh, is it on your drive? In my case, it's in my Dropbox because that's where it went. That picture I took earlier went right to Dropbox. So I am going to go into Dropbox and find this picture. And where are you, you little monkey? Okay, here's a picture that I can do. Oh, there it is, right there. I'll be darned, there it is, okay. So now I'm attaching the picture to the email and it's being uploaded to Gmail. Um, even if your email package is local, when, when I say local, I mean that the, your email resides on your local computer, the one that's in front of you. This is a cloud computer. This is a local computer. 
doesn't matter. At the point where you send the email from a local computer, it has to upload. Okay, and that's what it's doing. It did it did the upload pre uh, pre send. Okay, so now all I have to do is send this to me, and this time I should get it. And yes, I did. Okay, and it put the picture in line. Now. When I hover over the picture, it's going to ask me if I want to do one of two things. Download it, the down arrow is download, or put it on my drive, my cloud drive from Google. In all of your, in the case of all, for all of you, it's going to be you want to download the picture because you want to put it someplace where you can find it. Okay? So, in this instance, I'm going to tell the picture to download, and it's going to open up the downloads folder, and it's going to ask me, well, where do I want to put it? Do I want to even put it in downloads? Maybe I don't. To find the picture really easily, why don't we just put it on the desktop? So there it is. It's going to download to the desktop, and if I say save, It will save this picture to the desktop. And again, all I have to do is find it. There it is, right there. Okay, so if I double click on it, if I double click on it, okay, there's, a, there's my picture. I've downloaded the picture from email now. Uh, whether it's your source cable mail and you're using Windows Live Mail, which is local, or, Windows, uh, or Outlook Express or whatever, doesn't matter. Um, the thing you want to do is download the picture to a place where you know where it is. And in my case, I told it I wanted it to go to the desktop so I could find it more easily. <laughs> yes? I see you're in Windows Live Photo Gallery. Yes. My little uh, iPad. Uh, Windows Photo Gallery to open up, and then the little uh, curse, you know that little yeah. icon, what I'm saying? Yeah. It keeps coming up. Okay. Um, apps are using my thing, but I don't know. Yeah. Do you have, a, you have another app on your computer from your printer that opens photos, right? I do, think so. do you have nothing else that opens photos? Just the photos on the computer. Yeah. Okay, all right. So when you use Windows Live Mail. Windows Live Photo Gallery. Oh, Windows Live Photo Gallery. Well, I don't know that much about it. Uh, I'm just saying your iPhone yeah. doesn't pop up on you. Mine no. Does. Oh, okay. Well, then <laughs> the shut off locations. Yeah, that's what I did. Yeah. Um, okay. So here we go. Uh, there's, there's our picture downloaded to the computer. So I'm just going to go through it one last quick time of how to download this picture. I'm going to take the picture and I'm going to make it go away. I'm going to delete it and I'm going to open up mail again. So there's the picture that my friend sent me. I sent it to myself. There it is in mail. Um, depending on your email package, um, you will be prompted as how to save a picture. Now, um, what email package are you using? Um, what are you using? A source cable. Source cable, and you're using Windows Live Mail? I guess so. I'm not really sure. It's email address. No, no, it's, uh, I want to know whether he's getting mail locally on the computer, or are, are you logging into the internet to get your mail? No, I have an icon on my basic screen. Yeah. Source cable. I get that. Okay, but that's, that's, um, not really answering my question, Do, does, does uh, a mail package open or does a web page open? I think the mail. Windows Live Mail or? Yeah. Outlook Express or whatever. No, it can't have the Outlook Express, not if he's on something new. Um, 
Okay, let me just let me let me just uh, ask you ask the computer something here. Um, okay, uh, this is not where we want to be. This is not where we want to be. But do you, uh, when you get your mail, do you have to log in yes. like this? Not quite like that, but something like yeah. that. Yeah, and so you have this up here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you are logging into a web page, uh, okay. which is what I'm doing over here. Okay, I'm logging into a web page over here. If you look around somewhere on, uh, on the web page, in the email itself, even if you hover over the picture that you've got, you may get some prompts to what you want to do. And as a matter of fact, if you right click on the picture, okay, it will, it will tell you that it can do some other things, okay. In this case, um, it's just going to copy the links or save the links. But in, in other cases, it may say, um, I, here's an opportunity to save the email. Do you want to save it to your desktop? Uh, the other thing is you can, uh, if, if it's there, the, the uh, little paper clip that I showed you before, if it's there as an attachment, you right click on the attachment and it will tell you that you can save the attachment to your desktop or wherever you want to. Uh, but that's something you have to play with. Uh, now that we've got this straight, that you are logging into a web page from Source Cable, okay, that changes things a little bit differently. You're going to have to play with it. As a matter of fact, if you, uh, it, you can ask, um, you can go through uh, some of the help, me f help files of, on Source Cable about downloading stuff from mail. Okay, and there should be ex explanations there on how to do it. Uh, because I'm not lo logged into Source Cable, I can't give you a specific direction, but I can tell you that they are just about all the same. So here again, um, I want to download this picture, so I'm going to click on the download. And it will ask me where do I want to download it. It opens, opens a new dialog box saying, where do you want to download? Save as. As a matter of fact, now you see right here where uh, this is highlighted in blue. Okay. Um, you can change this to a name if you want to. Don't touch anything, just start typing. Okay. Um, and I'm going to, I'm just simply going to uh, name it my pick. Okay. So it's now named it my pick. It's a JPEG image. And it's, go, it's going to, instead of downloading it with that hunky number, it's going to download it to this name, my pick. So I'm again going to put it to my desktop. I'm going to say save. And there it goes. It went in. And Look at this. It opened it up. I can open it in photos, photo gallery, but just for now, we'll just say photo gallery. And there it is. Okay? So that's only one way of doing it. There are a dozen others, um, but it's what you're comfortable with. Uh, you may have to get somebody when they're at your house that knows how to deal with this to show you, but it is easy to show you, but it is easy. <laughs> okay, um, that takes care of the, uh, this little email problem. Uh, now, I have totally forgotten where I was going to take this class <laughs> before. <laughs> Before I, I got into this, um, it just it's it's gone. It's gone. I, I've been having these kinds of problems for a year now. Um, oh, I know where I was going to take the class. Not so much Chrome as. Um, James and I, a couple of years ago, um, 
brought big boxes of stuff and put them on the table here and showed you what's inside your computer and all the parts and pieces well I've since thrown that box away with all the parts and pieces but it hurt to um, just go through some of the things that you can um, that are in your computer that you need to know about that are there that have names okay have names that would be nice okay how many of the class have a desktop you've got desktop 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 and you have a laptop as well okay make up your mind okay yes. okay um, well let's Um, let's just have a look and see what we can find in the way of desktops, okay? And and uh, you can you can have desktops like this, okay? Um, you can have desktops that are um, what we call all in one. This is the complete computer, all everything there. This is this is an Apple, but there are um, there are PC computers that are all in ones. Everything is in the screen. Your uh, DVD drive, um, all of your connections are all in the screen. It's an all-in-one. Um, this is another all-in-one. The uh, keyboard and mouse are uh, separate from the computer, but that's everything else is in the computer. It's er, in the screen. It's not a box. Okay. This is a box. Okay? This box over here. It's the desktop. Okay? Is it called the tower? tower? Yeah, the tower, the desktop. CPU? C uh, no, that comes later. Okay. This is just the box. But let's talk about what's inside the box. Okay? And let's start from there. CPU. Central processing unit is the brains of the outfit. CPU. And a CPU is a computer chip set that looks like this. It goes on the motherboard of the computer. It's not much bigger than that. Inch and a half by inch and a half. That little item there is capable of millions and millions and millions and millions of operations a second. And when I say operations, an operation is being able to jump from a zero off to a one on. Zero, no voltage. One has voltage. Zero, no. One, yes. And that's where this whole binary idea comes from. It's zero or one, voltage or no voltage, yes or no. Binary. Only two things. And it can only be one of them at a time in this configuration. Someday we'll talk about quantum computers, which can be four things at once. But in any event, this is the brains of the outfit. Uh, over the years, these things have gotten faster and faster and faster, and they run hotter and hotter and hotter, and they are now at a point where the, the technology is such that uh, it's bumping up against uh, Moore's Law. And Moore's Law stated 40 years ago that every 18 months, the capacity of computer chips will double. That was 14 or 40 years ago. So divide 18 a year and a half into 40 years, and and it will give you um, a figure which you can then multiply by 10. And if you do that, 
you will get 10 to the ninth. And that, ex that exponent, 10 to the ninth, is pretty near a billion. A billion. Okay? So in 40 years' time, computer chips have up their power a billion <coughs> times in 40 years. Now they're bumping up against Moore's Law. The, 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 the chips are being so finely engineered that at, at the very next point that they come to, um, the molecules are too, too close together to work anymore. Um, this used to be, uh, the molecules in this were about 320 microns uh, apart. Okay. Uh, now, these computer chips are down to uh, about 28 um, nanometers, billionths of a meter. A meter, billionth. Okay, so the, the molecules are that close together that we can't get them any closer. They start to interfere with one another in, uh, in very, very strange ways. Okay, so that's the brains of the outfit. Um, let's go back here and talk about where the brains of the outfit fits. Onto motherboards. Now, this, is, this has to do with uh, tower computers, um, a desktop computer. This is the arrangement that fits inside the box. And the, uh, the uh, CPU fits in this area right here. Okay, It just slides in there with a couple of clips it goes in. Uh, real easy process. But here again, these things over the years have become so complex that um, here again we're bumping up against Moore's law about how closely can you put circuits together, how, how closely can you pack them. These motherboards are bumping up against that. So at some point or other we will not be able to get motherboards that are faster, more powerful, can handle um, faster and more powerful CPUs. At some point or other, we're stuck. Unless a major breakthrough happens in physics. It's the major breakthrough is coming, it's about 20 years away. Um, motherboard. That's for the tower. Let's do one um, for the laptop. Okay, and you can see that they are quite, quite different uh, as for this one here. Let's try that one. Okay, um, you can see that they are quite, quite different. Um, to a large degree, they are more compact. Um, they are smaller, they use less power. And because of that, they are in a lot of ways less efficient than a tower computer. They generate a lot of heat, that heat has to be taken away or the computer will burn down. And so they have to regulate the heat and that regulation is done by um, regulating how much voltage goes into the computer. The more volts, the more amps, the hotter it gets. The fewer volts, fewer amps, the cooler it stays. However, with fewer volts and fewer amps, the, the less powerful the brains of the outfit, the CPU. All kinds of compromises have to be made in a laptop to have them work properly. And one of the biggest ones is how do you dissipate heat? Um, so there you go, motherboard for a laptop. There. Now let's talk about 
how does the computer remember things? Okay, uh, it remembers things on a hard drive. The old spinning hard drive. This has five plates, five platters stacked on top of one another. There's more than one of these. There are five of these that go in between the platters and on top of the, the last platter here. So there's four in between and one on top. This head squirrels back and forth across the platter looking for data. The computer has registered where the data is in a file that's on the inside of this platter call, called the file allocation table. FAT. You've heard FAT in computers before. That's it. File allocation table. In here is, is information that tells this head where to go to get certain kinds of data. And one of the first places it goes after the hard drive starts to spin up this goes to the file allocation table on this inner ring and the file allocation table says you're looking for an operating system, maybe Windows, maybe OS 10, maybe something else. But it's located in this area of the hard drive. Swing that arm out and go there and seek operating system. You'll find it there. And so that's what the arm does. It snaps out, goes, goes and looks finds the operating system and starts to load it into memory. And then when it's done that, you can tell the computer, okay, you've done that, open a program. So, this little arm goes back to that inner file, uh, file allocation table ring and says, okay, you want, uh, you want WordPad. Where's WordPad? The allocation table says, it's about here on the ring. Go out there and get it. So it swings this arm out to that position and it starts seeking out WordPad as a program. Finds it, loads it into memory. See, all seems simple enough the way I've explained it, but it is mind-numbingly complex to the mind of a computer scientist who dreamed this stuff up 30 years ago. I can make it easy for you if I stay away from the details, okay? And those are all the details you as a user need to know. That when you hear a little click inside your computer, that's what you're hearing. You're hearing that little arm swing back and forth looking for data. And if you hear it clicking like a machine gun, that you're correct. You may be in trouble because it's saying, it's saying, uh, give me that information again from the inner ring. Okay, it's out here. I went and looked. No, it's not. Go back here. Give me the information again. Where is it? It's out here. No, it's not. Go back and look again. Click, 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 click. Okay, going off like a machine gun. It's done so fast. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. The all-in-one computers, <coughs> the same thing? Which, which process do you use? The laptop or the other one, the box? Um, All-in-one computers for the most part um, are laptop technology. Laptop. They're laptop technology. So the, their motherboards may be a little bit bigger, but here again, they've made that compromise of, of um, uh, power efficiency uh, for heat dissipation. That's okay. the Yeah. Uh, so uh, all-in-one computers really are a laptop technology. There's nothing wrong with that. Laptops can run for years and years and years and thousand years. Okay, just don't drop it. <laughs> All right, hard drive. Spinning disk type hard drive. They come in two sizes. Five and a half inch and three inch. Does that arm actually touch that disk? Or is there an no, there is an air gap. Yeah. If it touches that disk because you've dropped it and that disk is spinning, it's, uh, it will remove a portion of the surface of the disk where the information is, is on that surface. So if you remove, remove the surface because it went crash while it was spinning, okay, it's torn up that disk, you, there's no information there anymore. So 
So stuff jumping across that gap. No, no, it's it, it's uh, it's doing it um, by uh, magnetism. Okay, the, these are magnetic grooves on this. So the the information is laid down magnetically and it's retrieved magnetically, like tape, like magnetic tape. The the uh, the actual um, tape machine does does not really touch the magnetic tape. There's a barrier there. Okay, in this case, it's an air barrier, so it can the information uh, jumps across that gap magnetically. Yeah, Bob, it kind of sort of reminds me of the old phonograph record. Highly sophisticated. Yeah, except for there's nothing that touches the platter. Like I said, it's all done magnetically. All right. So that you're right in that, um, except for the fact that there are portions of this disk that tell the computer where things are. So let's not go down this rabbit hole too far. Um, I can if you like, but it's not going to be a nice trip. <laughs> okay, the next thing that your computer has a plenty of is memory. And not this kind of memory. <laughs> uh, losing that fast. <laughs> yeah, that's gone. <laughs> and so we'll uh, refine the search a little bit. We'll say random access memory. And there we go. Um, by the way, a lot of people, when they talk about this stuff, try and um, make a connection between how your brain remembers things and how these little sticks, these little engineered sticks remember things. There is absolutely no connection between how this stick remembers things and how your brain does it. There is no connection. There's, there's no allegory. There's no nothing. It's mechanical. It's completely different. Okay? It all has to do um, with where zeros and ones are stored on these little memory chips, these little black memory, uh, these little black di disks here have a chip inside them, something like the chip I so showed you for the CPU, uh, where um, zeros and ones can be planted in given locations. And the computer on that spinning disk knows the location of the a particular zero or one because the spinning disk told it where it was. Um, the more of this stuff you have inside a computer, the better for you, hooray. Older computers had a gigabyte of this stuff or 512 megabytes to make a gigabyte. Okay, If you have a gigabyte in an old computer that runs Windows XP, which you have, um, it will hum along perfectly nicely. Because the operating system is not that big that it fills it up completely, it's getting there. If you had two gigabytes of memory in your computer, it would just scream in Windows XP. But if you've only got one gigabyte, it's going to be a little slow and clunky because it has to move stuff out of memory, put it back on the hard drive, load memory off, load things off the hard drive back into memory so it can use it. Then when it's done with it, it throws it back on the hard drive and back and forth and back and forth. That's a slow operation. But these things here, um, are really the work and understanding of a science that was first dreamed up in the late 20s and early 30s and became a science and became a science 
that uh, we know today as quantum mechanics. Um, I'm not going to go into it. It is really, really strange. But it's how everything today works. If it has a memory chip, it needs quantum mechanics to work. If it has GPS, it needs quantum mechanics to work. If it's a simple radio telephone, it needs quantum mechanics to work. And these things are the result of scientific breakthroughs in the 60s. They have not changed much since then. These things were dreamed up in the 60s and put together by hand. Now uh, machines do that in uh, what we call foundries, chip foundries. Okay, so that's um, not how the brain works. Um, let us go back to hard drives for a minute. There, the modern hard drive in a computer, which is in this one, because this one is not very old, it's only a couple of years old, and it has been upgraded with a very modern kind of hard drive. It's called an SSD hard drive. Solid state drive, SSD, solid state. Um, this is a solid state hard drive. It's a thumb drive. Okay. 16 gigs, not too bad, a little slow, but it attaches to the outside of your computer and you can put information on it. This, uh, these are also solid state hard drives, which you can put inside and attach to the motherboard of your computer and they act for all the world like spinning disks, only 10 times faster. 10 times faster. These things attach to uh, the motherboard as the spinning disk would with a couple of cables, one for power, one for data. The power cable here, the data cable here, and they move information back and forth. Let me see if I can get this one a little bit bigger. And if you can see it, what you have right here is a disk, or uh, I should say a computer chip that looks for all the world like that CPU that we talked about initially. Okay? Well, that is a CPU. And these other chips along the side here are memory chips like you would find um, in random access memory. Only these are not volatile. When I say volatile, I mean that what's on, what's on a, memory, uh, a memory chip, if, you, if it loses power, it loses information. The information's gone. Uh, but in the non-volatile world, if, this, if these chips lose power for whatever reason, uh, either through accident or design by shutting it off, um, the information remains in place. The ones and zeros are where you planted them. That does not go away. And so, the thing you can say about them is they're non-mechanical. They're non-mechanical. Remember, the spinning disk is just that, a spinning disk. Inside of the, that box that we had the top off of, okay, if you looked carefully, uh, there was an axle on that spinning disk. And that axle connects to, to a bearing on either end of it. Okay? And that disk spins at 5,200 revolutions per minute. How many of you remember when you was little gaffers, like I was, years and years ago, and your teacher would do the science experiment with the bicycle wheel. 
okay? Give you a bicycle wheel and with an axle through it and handles on either side and would start to spin the bicycle wheel, okay? Nothing wrong with that. You can hang on to it as a little gaffer. You can hang on to it. But then you were told, turn the bicycle wheel 90 degrees to the side. What happened? You started to turn with it. Okay? You started to turn with it. Inertia. Mechanical inertia made you turn. Now that bicycle wheel was turning at about maybe 20 revolutions a minute. 5,400 revolutions, 7,800, 10,000 revolutions a minute or something quite different. If that disc is spinning inside of that box and you turn it sideways, the forces on that axle are enormous. You can feel it in your hand. It wants to stay in the same position it was in. And if it's spinning at 10,000 uh, RPM, you've got a time getting it to turn up on its side. Once it's there, it becomes stable again. And to turn it back, you got a job doing it. But moving it up and down and, and around and here and there, you're wearing out those bearings. Enormous stra stresses on them. And it's the same thing with your laptop computer. That little hard drive inside there, that little three inch hard drive, it's spinning at 5400 RPM. And if you carry your laptop around with you and you're constantly changing its, its angle from here to here to here, uh, throw it over there, it's still running. Whether it's sleeping or not, that hard drive is spinning. Okay, and it's doing, it's creating enormous forces on the bearings on the hard drive. Are they diamond? Um, they are materials beyond that. Material science has made, uh, made for those connections to be so they don't wear out easily. And they are, they, you can't put lubrication inside, inside of a hard drive because it will mess it up. Lubrication will just mess up everything. So uh, material science has come up with uh, materials that can take these enormous stra strains and stresses. You don't have to know about them, just that they are there. Uh, but the fact is, is that when you move a laptop around, you're putting enormous stresses on the hard drive. And if you move it too many times, it will fail. Is, is that when, even when it's turned off and unplugged? Oh no, when it's turned off and unplugged, if the, the, the drive is not spinning. But if it's, if it's turned on, even if it's sleeping, that drive is still spinning. Maybe at a lower rate, but it's still spinning. And if you change its angle, as you would like that, or this, it puts enormous strains on that. Uh, with these um, solid state drives, we don't have to worry about that anymore. It's come down to the point where a computer with a solid state drive has exactly no moving parts. This is a good thing. This is a great thing, considering that even only 10 years ago, there was an enormity of moving parts in every computer. And every moving part could fail. Okay? So in, in this laptop, there are no moving parts. Uh, it, there is even... Um, a design inside the body of the computer, if the laptop heats up, it moves air. It moves warm air or cooler warm air across the CPU to cool it. And it does it in a passive manner. Okay, no moving parts at all. So, that's solid state drives. We've looked at memory, um, motherboards, the case that all fits into. Um, I should tell you that uh, when you go and look at new, uh, new computers and you're thinking about buying uh, a new computer laptop, thinner is not better. 
Thinner is flexible. Flex it too much and you'll break it. That's why I like this. It's really robust. You know, I can't do things like that to it. Okay, but are one of those really thin jobs like, like a MacBook or something like that where this top is really, really thin, you can squish them around and event, if you do that enough, eventually you'll break something, particularly the hinges. So um, in laptop computers, thinner may not be better. If you're just going to have it in one place forever, yeah, okay, it looks pretty. Uh, the brand new Macs, MacBooks, are rose gold. Gag. <laughs> That's the most god awful shade of pink I have ever seen. And they want 2500 bucks for that. Rose gold. Ugh. Um, can I ask a question regarding memory? Yes. <clears throat> Uh, in order to preserve the memory you have, is it wise to delete certain things? Okay, when you're, t when you're talking about programs and such from the hard drive, that's what you're talking about. Uh, there is another way to look at this, but I'll come back to that after I talk about programs on your hard drive. Um, I used to say to my clients um, pretty much a while ago, that if you buy a 250 gigabyte hard drive for your computer and you install it um, and you fill it up, go and get a life because you don't have one. If you're using that com your computer that much that you can fill a 250 gig hard drive in a year or two, you don't have a life. Go get one and get a bigger hard drive. Um, now, hard drives uh, come um, as a matter of course in a terabyte which is four 250 gig hard drives. Terabytes as far as cost goes are about 3.9 cents a gigabyte. 3.9 you can buy a terabyte drive for $39 3.9 cents a gigabyte. So, uh, now, filling one up. Your computer uses its memory in two ways. It just has stuff that sits on the drive, and when it's called for, the little arm gets sent out to go and retrieve the stuff and throw it back into memory for you so you can use it. The other thing that um, is required is that certain parts of certain programs be loaded on the computer to make it operate. Um, the more of those you have running in the background, the slower your computer is going to be because like I said, you get back into this swap thing where the, the random access memory fills up. It's got to be, you got to delete some memory out of it, put it up back on the hard drive, back and forth and back and forth. And, yeah. and your computer goes, oh. Stop doing that. Um, so, the thing to do if you need more space on your hard drive uh, for more stuff, like pictures, documents, um, maps, whatever you're working with, um, then the thing to do is to get a secondary hard drive and start spreading the joy around. Put some stuff off the, your computer hard drive onto a second hard drive. And you can do that and it frees up space. Does it make your computer run faster? Not much. Not much. It's just that you have more room to play with when you're, when you're um, downloading big files or looking at movies or something like that. Um, the other thing that you, can, that you need to do as far as memory goes and your computer goes is you need to manage what um, you need to manage what programs are starting up when your computer starts up. And so we'll have a look at that. I've uh,
started up a program here that will tell me what things are starting up when my computer starts up. So my, uh, my video card starts up, that's enabled. Uh, my OneDrive starts up um, and that takes quite a bit of memory, high. Um, I told the computer, I don't need iTunes helper, I'm not using iTunes. Why would I load it in the background and have the computer take up CPU cycles for something I'm not using? So I told iTunes helper, don't load. The same thing for, the, um, um, for Skype, don't load. When I call you, you'll come. Then we'll talk about the memory you can have. Okay. Um, these are, and all of these other things are enabled because I might need them. Um, the pointing device, which is the trackpad. Okay. Um, the wireless card, I need that to talk to the internet. Um, and so it goes. And you can um, tell your computer to enable or disable th these things um, at your leisure. Uh, if you want to do that for yourself, please be careful. Where did you find that window? Oh, I, uh, there's a special, commit, a special command that gets it. It's called msconfig. Can we do that? I don't recommend it. <laughs> Move on. Yeah. Move on. That's okay. So that's the thing about memory. There's there's two ways of looking at it. Uh, you can free up hard drive space if you need it, but you can also free up used RAM. Okay, and that will help your computer run faster if it's choking up a little bit. Yeah, excuse me. I was just told right here one of the years ago. For example, you get a pile of emails which you've read and you just left them there. Yeah. And if you if you go back into your computer and say, geez, I don't need these things, wipe them all out. Does that help memory? Um, yes, it does. Uh, but more than anything, it helps the, the, the email program itself. Um, if you have 2,000 old emails sitting in your email program, when you launch your email program, it has to uh, look at every single one of those and make them available to you if you wanted to go and look at it. You may not want to, but if you do want to, the computer has to make them available to you. And so that takes resources. So why not get rid of 1,500 of that 2,000? Okay? Go back two years and just get rid of them. It slows down the program is what it does. It doesn't necessarily slow down the computer, but it slows down the email program itself. Um, as it has to... Uh, um, put these old emails in some semblance of an order that the computer can use them if you ever wanted to click on one. Okay? Am I getting rid of them then when I read it, delete, or send it on, and then I go to delete it and I re-delete them all? Yeah. As, lo as long as uh, if you delete an email and you don't remove it from the deleted items, it's still there. Sent? Yeah, the same thing with sent. Sent. If you delete them, they will go to deleted items. You have to go into deleted items and delete them from there. Okay? Unless you, there is a checkbox hidden away about nine clicks deep that says, um, on exit, empty the deleted items. <laughs> but if it's not doing that, it's nine clicks deep to go and find it. it just do it by hand. Okay. Uh, where are we now? We're done. We're done. We're done. I hope that helped you out quite a bit. Because, uh, like I said, it's it's been a couple of years since James and I did this. I, when I bought a laptop, what, nearly five years ago now, I took apart my old thing because I wanted to know what was inside. Good for you. But it only had one disc, but it had something that I thought of as a movie. It had some the yellow tape going around near the disc. Okay. From what, and that, and Geek who moved everything over, he says, that's your memory. Cut that up and burn it if you want to. So I did, but yeah. what was it? Yeah. Um, that, that was the, the, the pathway by which 
the, uh, the items from the disk got to the computer. There, there was a pathway, okay? Yeah. Um, right here, you see that right there? That little tab right there? That's the pathway for data. And it goes through a cable. On yours, uh, that pathway was, was sort of a, a little ribbon. If you cut the ribbon, then you've cut the pathway. The, uh, the hard drive is, well, it exactly yeah. like old movies. Things. Yeah, exactly so. Yeah, exactly so. And it, the, that arm that you the moved, yeah. Those that thing that's holding it, that's a magnet. Yeah, it's a it's an earth it's an earth magnet. You have to be very very careful with it. If if you separate it and you get it between your fingers, it will crush it. It will. Take my word for it. It's, there's five or six hundred pounds. Yeah, scary. Yeah, these are rare earth magnets. Yeah, um, they are not frig fridge magnets. <laughs> <laughs> they are not fridge magnets. All right, there you go, folk. I will try and get this up as quickly as I can, but I've got a full day today and a full day tomorrow. It might be Wednesday before I get you up. All right, thank you. Yeah. That's Computer Club lesson for today. Thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.